I'm going to talk about changing the world. I probably should have narrowed my focus, and I did try, but I finally decided that talking about changing the world is the most important thing that we can talk about ever, and probably the only thing we should ever talk about. We should talk with our teachers, talk with our friends, talk with our college, talk with people who are like us, and talk with people who are different from us. I'm going to tell you about three experiences from my life today, from the beginning of my career when I was 20 years old, starting out in global health, because that's the time of life that you're at now. I've done many other things in many other places, but the kind of special learning that happens when you're starting out is really <coughs> important, so I decided I decided to focus there. Um, but some of you may have had the audacity and heart to tell someone older and wiser that you want to change the world. You might have been discouraged by their response. They might have said, who do you think you are? What makes you think your ways are best? What makes you think you know? And what right do you have to change other people? They might have said, Good intentions aren't enough. A lot of these do-gooders do are pretty ineffective, and some of them do harm. There's half-built schools and unfinished clinics. There are latrines with holes large enough that small children can fall inside. People solving problems on the one hand and creating problems on others. So changing the world gets kind of messy. They might also tell you that changing the world um, is OK, but we have a lot of problems here at home. Why can't you focus on that? Seems kind of easy to see the problems that far away and be, be drawn to the exotic, instead of looking at the disparities in your own life, in your hometown, maybe even on your street. So it's kind of challenging. <coughs> they also may tell you that things are more complicated than you realize. That these cultures that you're hoping to change are hundreds of years old. What makes you think your quick fix-it solution would work? Extensive study and assessment is required before any action at all can be taken. They might try to tell you that the sustainable, abundant life that you're hoping for for everyone is just not possible. You're being too idealistic. It would take generations. And it's not possible to provide food, water, education, health care, and a secure home for everyone. It's not possible to create a world where everyone is free to express their culture and identity. Now I have to note here that um, this, these messages of impossibility are spoken in a world where we can deliv million, deliver millions of Harry Potter novels in one day. You've, you've been the generation that bought them, right? Um, we can imagine with no trouble at all, a population that in 20 years everyone would have a cell phone. And every year, we throw away enough food to completely close the gap between the food we need and, and, and completely close the, the hunger gap. Now, despite all my refutations, the advice that you're getting is valid. You need to learn cross-cultural skills. You need to be very respectful. You need to be very humble. And you need to wrestle with complexity with a lot of patience and strength and gentleness, I would add. Um, you need to think about effectiveness and sustainability. All those things are very true. Sometimes you're very simple, you new generation. You, you say things like, well, if everyone in our university sponsors a child in poverty <coughs> in Milwaukee or in Appalachia or in Botswana or India, wouldn't, wouldn't that up? Wouldn't, wouldn't that make huge change? You use the simple arithmetic and its sound of a five-year-old. This exasperates the expert. But thankfully, you persist. You are more globally interconnected than any generation before. You are more able to embrace complexity. And you're willing to try and admit your errors and keep trying until you get something right. 
So maybe you're in a better position to assess what's possible than we are. I do sometimes wonder why those of us uh, who mentor young people start with this long list of don'ts and cautions. What's that all about? I think maybe there's some intergenerational tension going on. We gave you this world that you're so unsettled about, and you remind us of that when you want to make change. No matter what we're doing, you're wonderful. Your energy and is wonderful, and it's also terrifying. Today I'm going to talk about some experiences in my life where I learned in unexpected places. And as I said, I decided to go back to my early career. There's many cautionary tales and illustrative tales, but these are things you know, where, where I, really, uh, I really learned something that, that lasted. So it's a little bit of a distillation of my youth. Thank you for the invitation to do that, by the way. Um, so I first left the country in 1983. I joined the Peace Corps, and I was sent to Honduras to work with young women who'd been abandoned or orphaned in childhood. And my job was to counsel them and support them. One thing that I did was to help them uh, go to the towns of their birth and get their civil registration, their birth certificates, which brings with it a lot of rights. And uh, it's, a, it's really a protective thing that you want young people to have. And those journeys took me around the country on buses in the back of pickup tr trucks on foot. But when I think about that time in my life, there's a particular series of events that I thought would be useful to you now. Uh, I was having coffee with a Peace Corps friend, and she was worried about me. She said that I seemed burnt out being a live-in counselor, and that she was also worried that I wasn't really doing development work. What I was doing wasn't really sustainable and didn't really have a multiplier effect, like when you train trainers or when you, when you give seed to a farmer who in turn gives seed to someone else. I was comforting young people and counseling, and I was refereeing a lot of chores. So I was, I was kind of more like a glorified babysitter than a world cha changer. Um, a few days later, I was part of a, a, a fair that we put on for the children. There was a sort of a dry, colorless field outside the children's homes, and we decided to fill it with games and fun for a day. And the girls and I dressed up like clowns for the younger children. So uh, by the end of the day, I was responding to payasa, venga, which means come here, clown. We just had a great time. And we, we had candy, piñatas. Uh, it was a very simple day at the fair. And we wanted to make memories for these children. Later that day, one of the girls came to my room, uh, sat on my bed. She looked very upset. She's on the verge of tears. Tears. Her, her name was Carolina. So I thought, boyfriend trouble again. Started to fill the air with questions, solidarity, advice, trying to ask her things to help, you know, help her disclose to me what had happened. It's not that, she said finally. I just miss her. After 17 years in that orphanage, she'd finally decided to reach out and talk to someone about her abandonment. And she reached out to me. I felt so badly to have gotten it so wrong, to miss the obvious sorrow. I put my arms around her, and she cried. And I cried, too. She didn't expect me to do anything else, and I didn't. After she left, I thought about that phrase, multiplier effect, again. And I realized just how arrogant and wrong it was. Because that really meant that someone like me spending time to, to, to comfort someone like Carolina wasn't, wasn't worth the effort. That one-to-one -one return on investment wasn't the math of international development. The fun fair that we'd done didn't add up either. That was a loss leader at best, even though it brought joy to children who'd suffered a great deal. I decided that day that I would let go of doing great things just a little bit. And I would try to be a person who had the heart and time to do small things. 
Now that day, I did not do the small thing particularly well. But I could work on that, I could get better, and I hoped that somehow this would lead to change. I wasn't sure how it would work, but I did take comfort in the math. One and one makes two, multiplication aside. A few years later, I was participating in a research study uh, for the Harvard School of Public Health as a, as a student uh, uh, researcher um, in, in Nicaragua. We, were, we wanted to document the impacts of low intensity conflict on civilians. And we were doing some household surveys in a war zone in Chontales, which is a region of Nicaragua. And we'd gone out to one town. It was about as far in as we could go with relative safety to do this survey. And we were looking for things like um, interruptions in schooling, interruptions in uh, to, to, to health care, injury, other kinds of in internal migration, other kinds of impacts that you might expect in this kind of war situation. And we, we uh, we mostly found what we expected, and it was important, and we, we published it as, as planned. But I think the big learning for me uh, that occurred during that time was during the interviews, after I put my clipboard down and say, is there anything else you want to tell me? Then I leaned forward and listened. I listened to what people would tell me about their lives when they didn't have the structure of a survey and coded answers. They talked about their hopes and fears and what it had been like to live in the war. They talked about how they would get food or water, maybe getting back to the school, the, maybe getting the kids back in school soon. There was one house in particular that I remember. We walked up to it and it was boarded up, not just the doors shut, which people usually leave the doors open, but the windows were shut. I almost felt it was intrusive to knock and ask to do the interview, but I did knock anyway, and they let us in. And two sisters lived there. Juana and Fidelia, and they, uh, after the interview, they, they told me their stories. And Juana was very calm. Uh, she spoke briefly about uh, what she'd been through. She had been married to a Mosquito Indian, and he'd been a miner, but was now working as a day laborer. Uh, and they had been relocated from where they were living to this town, because where they were living was no longer safe for civilians. She talked about what it was like to live with constant violence or fear of it. So it wasn't just the gunshots in the morning, but watching over your shoulder while you wash the, wash the clothes or cross the field. Fidelia had a thin face and very urgent speech, and every time Juana would pause, Fidelia would start talking, and it got kind of, I almost couldn't keep track of which sister was telling me things. But she, she um, was a widow with eight children, and she had lost her husband when he was killed uh, by gunshot at a, at a family party along with eight other men and one woman uh, from that family. She started to name the widows and count the orphan children. 34 children in all lost their lives in that community, and a whole generation of men were, were uh, lost as well. Juanita and, uh, Juana and uh, Fidelia were, were afraid to speak out, but they wanted to tell me their story. They wanted me to know and they said they wanted me to tell other people. Research is a powerful tool for change. I knew that before I went to Nicaragua. But what I realized from doing that work and from being with Juana and Fidelia and many others was how important story, solidarity, witness, and hope can be if we want to change the world. Not that long afterward, I found myself in Guatemala working on a uh, water and sanitation program in the very remote areas of a, a region called Quetzaltenango. And my job was to help to design a water, uh, a monitoring system for the water and sanitation program. And so um, we were going to go visit a, a remote village uh, to see the new well. So we got up early in the morning before at sunrise, but it felt like before, uh, and we rode uh, to the end of the paved road, and then to the end of the dirt road. And at that point, someone had prepared breakfast for us. They knew we were coming. So before we made the hike up into the village, we would be able to eat. 
And it was um, a very simple meal of blue corn tortillas and black beans and sour cream. Some hot, co hot sweet coffee in a tin cup, and we sat in a circle together. It was, I don't know if it was the fresh air or I was the fact that I was so hungry or the hospitality or the quality of the food itself, but I, re I still remember this as one of the best meals of my life. Um, then we hiked up, in we hiked up toward, the, toward the village. It was very beautiful, kind of sparsely populated, beautiful, hilly terrain. And we came to a river that had to be crossed, and there was a, a very uh, narrow walking bridge. It was kind of like the width of a log and a plank that you had to cross. And the rest of the team crossed, and I made the mistake of looking down, and I hesitated, and I, I just froze. I, I froze at that side of the river, and I did not feel comfortable crossing the bridge, the little walking pa uh, plank with no railings. Um, and as this happened, a local woman was coming up the path, and she she smiled at me kind of reassuringly. And she didn't she didn't speak English or Spanish, and I did not speak Mom, which was her language. As she got closer, I could see that she was about six months pregnant. But she crossed over the uh, bridge to offer me her hand and helped me to cross the bridge. And I looked straight ahead and followed her lead, and I did get across. And uh, I don't know what I would have done without her help. When we got to the village, uh, all the villagers were together waiting for us to tell us their story. And uh, we sat in a circle, and they shared their story with us about how they got water to their village. They were really obvious. This is a big moment in the life of a village, right, when you get water. I had, I had known that CARE was helping to install water in many villages in the region. What I didn't know until I got there was the intensity of effort that um, the, the community had made to achieve this. They had carried all the materials up by hand. They had fought for rights to the land. And they had done the work share for people who couldn't do work because they were elderly or whatever other reason. And I think I learned that day that whenever we do effective global health work, we, um, we also uh, we think we did something really wonderful, and maybe we did. But the local partners always do so much more than we realize. And we who have this privilege of crossing worlds receive so much help and assistance. And people are accommodating, accommodating our needs in ways that we don't even see. So it's something to be very, very grateful about when you have the opportunity uh, to do this kind of work. So um, as I close, I guess I'd just like to say, so you want to change the world? Go for it. You want to be part of that uh, selfless giving, the friendship, the solidarity? Um, I think you should dream about it and talk about it and work together for it. Um, take action, most importantly, personally, locally, and globally. And sing all the songs while you're young in every language that you can. Have faith in yourselves. Have faith in your world. Have faith in faith itself if you can. And when you can't, when the faith is hard, do the math. And if the math is difficult, ask a five-year-old, because small changes are big. And with small changes, you can change the world, and you can let the world change you. Thank you.